I thought Jeannie's suggestion was good on your journey to Jesus during Lent. Um, but however, why not extend it even past Lent? If it's that good for just a, a week, maybe God would be saying it's something you ought to keep doing. I, w I would suggest you read the Bible. Now, I know you probably do. And you've probably read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 through 6 or 7, because I always ask you to read what I want to preach on. And uh, you're not on the camera. How many of you have read ahead? And where are you at in 1 Corinthians? Hold up your fingers to what chapter you're on in 1 Corinthians. Do I? You're talking about coffee? Anybody reading 1 Corinthians? Are you waiting? Because I'm skipping through. I'm not reading all of it. And I want you to be reading it. If you don't, I'm going to have to slow down and read it to you like little children. And it's going to take longer. Okay, next Sunday I want to say, how many of you read 1 Corinthians chapter, wherever I quit today for a couple of chapters, and you're going to hold up your hand and say, yes, I did, but I'm not going to ask you today, okay? Because you probably didn't do it today. And if you're going to give up something for Lent, give up your not reading the Bible and start reading it, okay? That's such a loving, encouraging thing to say, isn't it, for the past? Um, today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm not sure how far we're going to go. We'll see, according to how much I have to read. But it talks about divisions in the church. It talks about judgment. It talks about the danger of tolerating sin in the church. Uh, I, one time I put on the reader board in my unpopular sermon. Maybe this is unpopular sermon number two. <laughs> I don't know. But if we're obedient to God, it shouldn't be unpopular. You know, there were divisions in the church in the old days, and there are still divisions in the church. And Paul is saying to the people here that we're not perfect yet. Well, I think I'm going to have to read. I didn't see any of you holding up your hands that you'd read. Um, divisions in the church prevent growth in the church. Did you know that? When people are divided in their thinking and not working together, it says, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Now he's talking to Christians. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy, and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Well, you see, they had several teachers, and we have many teachers in the church today. We even have different denominations. We have people that like some things better than others, and they teach things differently sometimes. And uh, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm finding jealousy and quarreling among you. Uh, some of you are saying, I follow Paul. Uh, he's more charismatic. I like him. And others are saying, I follow Ap Apollos. He's more eloquent in his preaching. I like his kind of sermons better. And he's better organized than Paul. Paul is a scatterbrain. You know, he just can't even make a complete sentence short. He has to write a whole paragraph every time he writes something. <laughs> if you read his letters, you'll see that. Others say, I follow, I follow Peter. He was original. He walked with Jesus. And um, Paul is saying here, he says, we're, we're all servants of God. That's what it's all about. And uh, through whom you came to believe. I started the church here. Apollos is watering it. But he's saying, but God is the one who's making it grow. It's God who's making it grow. We're just servants of God. And he says, everyone will be rewarded for what he does by God. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 is where we're at now. And he says, uh, he's the one I'm telling you about. And those who build on the foundation, Jesus is the foundation. And if you build on that foundation, you need to be careful what you're using for building materials. What you do with your life after you become a believer, that's what you're doing to build on the foundation of Christ. He says some people build on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, 
wood, hay, and straw. Now there's quite a difference there in those kind of materials. Some are more sturdy, some are more valuable. And he says, what are you building with? Are you using your best for God's purposes? There's going to come a time, he says, of judgment when all of this will be revealed, revealed what you have choose to build with in your life. The quality of your life will be tested. The quality, not the length of it, but the, the quality of it. How you used for God what he gave you, what he put into your possession, how much of it you used for his purposes and how much you used for your purposes. How you used your time, your money, your abilities, um, everything. How you used it for yourself or for God. He says God will judge this when the books are open. You remember we talked about the book of life with your name written in it and the books of life with the deeds of your life written in it. And uh, maybe I should read that part. This thing wants to turn around just a little bit. Christ is the foundation. By the grace God has given me, this is 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one of you should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So in other words, the things we do in this life after we build on the foundation of Christ, we build with what we do and who we are, and those things we build for God's glory will be rewarded, and those things we do for ourselves will be burned up. Someday all of that will be revealed. And then he talks about how this division that he sees among these new believers destroys the temple. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, your body is God's temple, and that God's spirit lives in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. In other words, he's saying, take care of your human body. It belongs to God. It's his temple. You remember, God lives in the third heavens now. That's where he reigns. But the Holy Spirit lives within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. Take care of your body, he says. And we've already read the list before as we've preached through Acts and Galatians and Thessalonians and now into Corinthians. The list of some of the things he tells us on how to take care of our body. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 23, he says, The wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. You remember how it, last Sunday we talked about how God confounds the foolishness, the wisdom of the wise he confounds in the intelligence of the intelligent. And I just say all you got to do to do that is read the Bible and then go watch the news. And you see the good news and you see the bad news. Um, you see how people today in their thinking are confounded, how they're making decisions that are not wise. Now, if you want to go into ministry, how many of you would like to be pastors? Uh, it's really, really, really neat thing. Here, here's what he says. Now, for those of you looking to be ministers, realize you are choos choosing servanthood. You're not going to probably be famous. You're, you're choosing to be a servant. Entrusted with the secret things of God. You're not going to gain probably fame, fame in this world. You're probably not going to receive an Oscar. Uh, but God is going to be able to put trust in you 
if you're willing to prove that you're going to be faithful to him. Now, this doesn't need to be a pastor. It can be Sunday school teachers. It can be any kind of people that are sharing Christ with other people. Paul says that he doesn't care if men judge him. He realizes that he stands accountable to God, and his works will be judged when Jesus comes back. He tells us not to judge things now because we don't have the full wisdom on how to judge them, but they will be judged when Jesus comes back. Jesus will bring to light, and I use sort of an illustration, on the big screen, the big screen back here, which will be bigger in the third heaven. He will bring to light uh, on the big screen what is hidden now. I always think of these uh, sports banquets they have where they say so-and-so had so many baskets, so many assists, so many touchdowns, whatever, ran the race in such a uh, record-breaking speed. They, they receive all of this praise and rewards. Jesus says, you're going to get your reward someday on the, on the bank when we have the wedding banquet and the big screen, and these things will be revealed. Now, some things you never even thought probably that you've done that God took note of. If you gave a glass of cold water, he says, in one place to people, in his name, it would be rewarded. God has rewards for these things. And he says all Christians will get into this banquet. Um, I think some people are going to have less footage on the screen than they thought, however. Some of the deeds they did to make themselves look good instead of to make God look good those clips will not be on the big screen. What's on the big screen will be what we have done to bring glory and honor to God. So we may be surprised at what we see and what we don't see in our own life and in the lives of others. We'll be rewarded, and uh, we, don't, we don't talk a lot about rewards. Maybe some Sunday I'll preach a sermon on rewards. God talks a lot about rewards. And rewards are neat things. He, it was his idea, not ours, to, to reward his people. Now, there is a warning, however, against pride in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. Uh, everything that you are or have, God has allowed you to have or to be. It wasn't your great wisdom and ability that did that. You really don't have anything to brag about, Paul is saying. Use it for God's glory. Now, Paul is feeling a bit misused here, and I hear sometimes preachers do that. If you go to pastor's conference, sometimes you'll hear a few of them uh, talking about how they just feel unloved or neglected or whatever. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 through 13, Paul even does that. Um, he says, for it seems to me that God has put a, us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We're fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty, we're in rags, and we have been brutally treated. We're homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. He's having a rough Monday. That's the way preachers feel on Monday sometimes, if they've had a bad Sunday, you know, and uh, the sermon didn't come across too good, maybe, or something. Or maybe it's after a business meeting. <laughs> Paul here appeals to the people. He, uh, he, he calls himself their father. He was the one who first spoke to them about Jesus and, and helped them come into the kingdom of God. And, uh, and here in 14 through 21, he uses, uh, he urges the people to imitate his way of life with Jesus. You see, people have, they not only heard Paul preach the word, but they watched Paul's life and how he acted and reacted to the things that happened to him. He says he's going to send Timothy to remind them of his way of life. 
which he says agrees with what I teach you. In other words, he's saying what I talk about to you is the way I live it. I have to practice what I preach. And uh, we all have to do that. Imitate me, he says. Um, he calls for discipline in their lives and self-control. And, and then he brings up this fact. He says a man is living with you here in the church in an immoral relationship with his father's wife. Now, uh, you know, these old guys sometimes had young wives and sometimes they had more than one wife. So here we have a, a man who has a son who's probably got a stepmother who's younger and there's an immoral relationship going on between the stepmother and, and the son. I tell you, the Bible deals with all kinds of stuff. doesn't leave anything out here. And he says, uh, this is no different from the way the world is acting. This is not right in the, in the church. And, uh, and so we might say, well, it's not my place to judge. I, I've heard so many people in the church say, it's not my place to judge. Did you know you're judges? We don't judge how the world lives. But God tells us to judge what goes on in the church. We are the example, supposedly, to the world. Our life should be different from non-believers. He says, this doesn't even go on in the pagan world. They think this is wrong, and here it's happening in the church. And Paul says, I've already passed judgment on it. Why, Paul, never thought you would be judging things. I've passed judgment on it already, he said. When you assemble, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of judgment. Paul isn't saying this because he doesn't like the person. He's saying because if he keeps doing this, he's not going to be in the kingdom of God. And I want his soul saved and his behavior corrected now. And it's up to you as the church to do it. You know better. Confusing scripture. A scripture in Matthew 5.30 sort of goes along with this. I read all kind of commentaries, and they say all kinds of different things. So I think I'll, when I get to this, I'll do like Paul. I'll say, this is what I think. And you can differ from me if you want. Uh, he says, if in, and Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And commentaries have said, you know, that doesn't really mean cut your right hand off. If, if you pick somebody's pocket with your right hand, it doesn't mean really cut your right hand off. It means stop picking people's pocket. Cut off that kind of behavior. Or if your eye offends, if, you, if you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, pluck your eye out. Well, we all know it's not just the eye. It's in the mind that causes the eye to look places they shouldn't look. And it's what causes the hand to do things it shouldn't do, etc. So I, I, I think he's talking about the body of Christ here, not the body, our human body. We're also called the body of Christ. And here Paul is saying in the, in, to the Corinthians, if this brother is offending, doing something he shouldn't, cut him off from the church. And then, however, Paul does say in 2 Corinthians, restore him back if he's repentant. So there's not a... There's not a a meanness in what Paul is saying here. He doesn't really want the person not to be saved. He wants the person to be shaken up enough that he would realize his behavior is wrong and that he'll change it and come back into a right relationship and be what God wants him to be. So the body of Christ is, has hands, eyes, feet. We're all made differently. We do different things. And if we see, see somebody doing something they shouldn't be doing, we should let them know about it. It says, go to your brother, let him know. If, if he refuses to hear you, take somebody with you. Bring it before the church. I mean, Paul deals with these things in a very positive way. He says, the church should be different than the world. And you are the judges of what you're doing in your church. And you should not let this kind of sin and wickedness go on. He says, it's like leaven in bread. It will infect the whole group. There's a danger of tolerating sin. A little yeast works through the whole batch. Get rid of the old yeast, he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Cut it off. Get rid of it. Paul is saying, don't even associate with people who are in the church acting like the world. 
They may say they're believers, but they're still living the way they did before they came to Christ. This is not right. And he gives a list of their present behavior, which is a, a different than the behavior of unbelievers. He says, I don't judge outside the church, but we do judge inside the church. We're supposed to be examples to the world. As most of you know, there have been and is being whole denominations of churches that are being divided because of acceptance of sin as okay in the church today. People just have different opinions of Scripture and do it differently, but we all love Jesus and we can all do whatever we think we should do. We have not been exempt from that in the Friends Church. Someday, Paul says, we will even judge angels. We will even judge angels. So sin in the church should be dealt with now. We should judge that. You should be able to judge also between disputes among yourselves without having to go to the human courts, he says. Christians should not have to bring lawsuits against each other. There are civil courts in the world, and when we have problems with people that are not Christians, those can be solved in civil courts. But Christians within the church with each other should be able to solve these things. They shouldn't have to take each other to court. Judge yourself between yourselves, he says. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. No, that's not what I want. Oh, six. Let me get over there. Chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. The dangers of tolerating sin. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are, as you really are. For Christ and pass, our Passover lamb has been sanctified. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. He says, I've written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, an idolater, a slander, a drunkard, a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you, he says. The wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. And then he says, and that is what some of you were. You were. <laughs> well, none of us have really good records from childhood birth. There has been sin in all of our lives. But he says, but you were washed by the blood of Jesus. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were set apart for God. And you were justified. You were made righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Then he goes in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, he talks about a couple of things. 
Uh, he talks about food and sexually, sexual immorality mainly, and I'm sure there are other things that could have been mentioned there and that he's mentioned other places, but he seems to draw attention to these two. And I don't know what I did with my notes just then. I really messed them up. He says your body is the temple of God. And the Holy Spirit is living within you. That's why you live differently now than you did before you asked me to come into your life. Now, my kids when they were growing up, and maybe yours too, would always say, Dad, why can't I do this? Or Mom, why can't I do that? Everybody else does it. Have any of you ever heard that statement? And my answer to them was, because you're an ox. Because you're an ox. Because you're in this family. And this is the way our family does things. You know, sometimes Dad would say, because I told you so. <laughs> sort of the same thing. Because we don't do this in our family. Just because some other families do it doesn't mean we do everything every other family does. And not only that, but you live in our house. Do you like eating here? Do you like sleeping here? Do you like having clothes here? Do you like living in our house. God is saying to us, you're a child of God. He's not saying you live in our house. He's saying, I live in you. Your body, Paul says, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We were bought with a price. God paid a high price for you. His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Honor God with your body and your mind and your soul and your spirit, all that you are. Honor God, not only by what you say, but the way you live. What you say honors or dishonors God. How you live honors or dishonors God. You are his testimony to the lost world today. That's who he's using, you. What they see in you will draw them to Christ. People are looking at you today, people you work with, people you live with, people you live around, your neighbors. They hear what you say some, but they watch how you live. Don't think they don't. Paul said, I urge you to imitate me. Live the way I live. Well, some preachers would probably make a whole sermon out of that, but of course, I'm going to be generous to you today. Can you say to your neighbors, live the way I live, do what I do? Most of us here, I think, are pretty familiar with the Bible and what it says. And we should be getting more familiar with it every day as we read it every day. Can you tell your neighbors, go to church regularly like I do. Give of your resources to God's purposes like I do. Pray every day like I do. Read God's word every day like I do. Commit yourself so that God is more important in your life than you are like I do. That's what God is saying. Paul is saying, do what, I, do what I do. And if we told everyone to do what we do, where would we be as a church? Hopefully a powerful church. And if we're not doing it, I would suggest you start doing it, not just for Lent, but for eternity.
May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Father, we're thankful for the price you paid for us. Help us to take it seriously. Help our lives to be a testimony as Paul's was to the people around him. May when people look at us, see our love, our concern, our compassion, our commitment in such a way that it would be something that your Holy Spirit could use to speak to their lives and to encourage them and make them want to become a child of God like us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.